Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's Heidelberg um, Joint Astronomical Colloquium, which is the very last in this semester. And I must say, it's really a special occasion um, because I have to say we have tried very often to twist Felix's arm to for him to give colloquium in our series, and we're finally able to achieve this. Um, Felix will be, of course, very familiar to a lot of you because he's been um, a landmark in the Heidelberg astrophysics um, environment for, I guess, three decades now, coming up to three decades. Um, and um, he started actually as a nuclear particle physicist, um, he did his PhD in uh, uh, MSc in, uh, in Moscow and his, and his PhD in the Moscow Engineering Physics Institute. And um, he went on to the Yerevan Physics Institute and he's working together with um, some of the very foremost physicists in the old UDSSR, um, for example, Zeldovich, Suniev. Um, later on, he moved, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, he moved out and he was working for a time in Chicago with Jim Cronin. And it's, I think at that point where Heinz Hulk um, and he came in together and um, Heinz, um, persuaded uh, Felix to come to the Max Planck Institute for Heidel uh, Kern Physik in Heidelberg, where he still is um, affiliated. And um, that started a highly um, successful collaboration, not only from the point of view of theoretical astrophysics, theoretical high energy astrophysics, but also the observational side. And Felix is one of the few people who, can, who actually could claim to be at the for leading edge in both those areas. And he has prayed this field of high energy astrophysics ever since. Um, I, um, he, later he joined uh, the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies as a professor of astronomy, that was in 2006, but always retained his strong links to Heidelberg where he was made an external scientific member of the Institute. And as I mentioned, he's played a key role in several uh, big projects. I think probably the biggest of all um, was the HESS project, which really started modern observational astronomy in the TEV energy range. And um, he has uh, latterly become a member of the LASO collaboration, which is actually now pushing the frontiers of real astronomy in the sort of hundreds, out to 100 TEV range. And I think Felix is going to actually uh, talk about some of the new results coming today from that. Um, there are numerous awards uh, for Felix. I, I should just mention one, which is the 2010 Rossi Prize, which he actually shared with Heinz Volk and um, Werner Hoffman for their uh, work with the HESS um, and together with the HESS collaboration. Um, and um, uh, 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 we, we are uh, extremely um, grateful to th that we have him in, 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 the, in, in, our, in our community here in Heidelberg. One last point, Felix did mention to me that um, when he became a member of the Dublin Institute, because of some, this has to be passed through the, the, the Irish Parliament in some way, uh, along with um, a few politicians uh, 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 going into some posts. And that year, it just so happened, that all the posts were um, for an infinite time. In other words, there is no retirement for Felix. Now, Felix tells me, oh, I'm not sure whether that's a good thing. Well, I can assure you, Felix, that for us is a very, very good thing. And we hope that you will be around working with us for many years to come. And I'll stop there and I just invite you to give, give us the latest um, of your knowledge on this field of high energy astrophysics in this, this talk entitled The Physics of and Astrophysics of Extreme Particle Accelerators. So Felix, please take it away. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, thanks a lot, Richard. Thanks for, of course, uh, for the kind invitation to give a talk here. I'm very happy, of course, and for the introduction. And uh, so I'm happy to share with you some recent interesting developments and related uh, in, in high energy astrophysics and astroparticle physics. And I am going to talk about some specific type of object 
so-called extreme particle accelerators, actually these objects are not simply just, it's not an emotional word extreme. It's, it has a definition and I'll explain a bit later. So these are very, uh, very peculiar uh, accelerators, uh, which are working at the edge of the allowed by theory, or I would say at the edge of reality. And uh, they are fantastic, unbelievable how they operate with such efficiency, but they do. And uh, we suspected a while ago that should be this kind of accelerators, I'll talk about them. But uh, recently, some very, there are some interesting developments in this area, observational ones. So we can uh, see that this, uh, this is a reality. They do uh, exist. And I'm going to talk about, uh, about this object. So just very brief introduction to say that these objects were, of course, belong behind the astrophysics and they are extreme, but our universe itself is a, high energy phenomenon. And at least in the framework of Big Bang, um, it was, its birth was incredibly energetic event. And quite a lot of time it was the hot soap consisting of relativistic particles and radiation. And even this very cold uh, 2.7K microwave background radiation is simply a relict of that soap. So now universe is much colder, but there are objects which we call them cosmic ray factories, which are part of accelerators part of uh, producing so-called fourth substance in the visible universe. This is after the matter radiation magnetic fields. So we could call cosmic rays is a very historical, uh, but more general, we deal with relativistic non-thermal plasma and uh, there are the cosmic ray factories, factories which are producing this plasma continuously, almost everywhere in the universe, including of course our galaxy on different scales uh, in different environments. And uh, what, uh, what is the common that all they work with extremely high efficiency. So um, now often uh, the, uh, the pressure of the substance, the relativistic particles, uh, can be comparable or even exceed the pressure contributed by thermal gas, turbulent motion, or radiation fields. This is, of course, at the low energies, not uh, at the very high energies. So they play a great role in many areas of astrophysics, uh, not only just uh, high energy phenomenon, like star formation is very important uh, for cosmic rays to introduce ionization. But I'm going to talk about much higher energies, which uh, the pressure is much less. They do not ionize, but they are present uh, interesting. So what, what are the relativistic matter factories? I put a gallery of objects. Very, very often, I mean, in these talks, we use these beautiful galleries, beautiful images. But what is different here now, all this, what I'm showing, they are producing high-energy gamma rays. So it's not just uh, imagination, it's not theoretical concepts, it's just we know all of them are producing gamma rays and therefore they are, uh, they are uh, particle accelerators. So um, they're completely different. You see, it could start from the stars, binaries like Novi and binary pulsars, microquasars, go to supernova remnants, large scale, much larger scales, galaxies, galaxy clusters, large scale jets, and again, small scale blazars um, in the very close to black holes, massive black holes. Just to mention that only one type of object, neutron stars, can uh, this acceleration could be realized in completely different ways, like Pulsars, pulsar magnetospheres. This is a standard, uh, standard way, uh, as all we know. But there is also pulsars in nebulae, which are energized by pulsars. 
and we yeah. see passive in Negoli. And at the same time, uh, we, 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 we think we don't see in this concept the pulse of winds, electron positron, called winds, which energize pulse of nebulae, but they can be seen in gamma rays, and probably we see them in gamma rays. Mm, anyway, so let, let's uh, don't to go too much to introduction, but just this was example to show that now this gallery, which consists 15 or 16 type of objects and all the are accelerators and some of them are extreme accelerators. So, and as I already said, we, we this knowledge comes from gamma rays and which are the perfect messengers of these cosmic accelerators. And they provide a critical window, crucial window in the electromagnetic spectrum and we often call it last window, and this last window consists actually is uh, 10 decades, just to compare the visible astronomy, visible part, it consists only half decay. And we are dealing here with 10 decades. It goes from the low energy to high energy, to very high energy and ultra high energy uh, domains, which are in other words, MEV, GV, TV, and PV. And uh, the, the, the now window is opened in all these four bands. And uh, just to mention that one PV implies 1000 Earth. So individual one single photon has 1000 Earth energy. And now I'll so, uh, show you some results that we are starting to detect even these this highest energies. So low and high energies are domain of space-based astronomy very high energy and ultra high energies are domain of ground-based astronomy. I'm not going to instrumentation. There are some talks here, I believe, and there will be no time just to show that this is a kind of Fermi lot, artistic view. There are very high energies. Most powerful instruments are imaging Cherenkov telescope. This is one of the magic telescope on La Palma. And uh, the, the highest energies, we use so-called Asia rays in different configurations, different ways. But here we detect the trend of light of the shower particles and here seem directly these particles. So uh, now I'm going to talk about TV and PV energies. And I would say that over the last two decades, we have seen at least, uh, the one revolution in TV gamma ray astronomy. I think this is not exaggeration. This really was a revolution when from the kind of field of cosmic rays, a branch of cosmic ray studies, uh, we now arrived with more than uh, several hundreds detected very high TV gamma ray sources. And this is all, all, already is exciting, but it's more exciting that these sources present more than 12, 13 or uh, source population, 15 source population now actually is growing. And this, of course, uh, remarkable achievements. And uh, so it was a surprise that the universe we could see is full of tevatrons. Tevatrons is come just from the Fermi lab. Tevatron, comparing this, tevatron is just accelerating, accelerating particles to TV energies. But surprise continues now. Over the last now one, two years, we have seen, I think we are witnessing the second revolution and that comes to the highest energies, ultra high energies. And for last one, two years, uh, have been discovered more than dozen ultra high energy gamma rays and numbers are growing. And again, not just now the number of sources is imp so important, but what kind of physics, what kind of astrophysics they bring to us. So the surprise continues. Now we realize now that Milky Way is full of tevatrons. So now I said universe with TV, Milky Way, Pevatrons. The problem is that uh, the gamma rays of energy 10 to 15 are effectively absorbed by photons 2.7 K MBR and mean free path is about uh, 10 kiloparsecs. So we effectively don't see gamma rays well beyond the Milky Way. But if you go to 100 TV, you could increase pre but not too much. You could go up to maybe 
few megaparsec, which is not so bad actually. You could see some starburst galaxies, gamma rays from starburst galaxies. So uh, to summarize, so now we, 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 we really, we are really astonished. We are surprised to see so many tevatrons and tevatrons. This is one part that, that we have so many of them in completely different environments, completely different scales. But what that they are accelerating some of them, accelerating particles with a rate, with incredibly high acceleration rate. And at the same time, they are working in a way that they convert available energy that could be pointing flux or the kinetic energy of shock waves converting to particles with efficiency more than 10%. It could go 50% or even more like in possibly nebula. So already I said, what kind of sources we see now? Here is at least, I'm, I want to save my time. Don't go to, to, to read all of them. And just to mention that this, this, this story is, uh, reminds uh, the early years of X-ray astronomy when accidentally uh, X-ray sources have been found. And then it appeared that X-ray uh, almost all astronomical uh, objects emit X-ray from supernova remnants, black holes to clusters of galaxies. Uh, it, it, it was exciting, but to some extent to heat the plasma to KV energies, it is, let's say, relatively easy. If you have the shock wave of few thousand kilometer, you terminate, thermalize, you get KV energies or in accretion uh, flows uh, to the, in the, uh, black holes environments, you also could. But acceleration is much more complex process. And that not simply acceleration and acceleration to highest possible energies. And again, everywhere. So that is exciting time. So very high energy gamma ray astronomy was a success story. TV astronomy, because first of all, Cherenkov uh, imaging telescopes. And here I said about this excitement, not, not only numbers, but also the number of source populations. But the, uh, another feature is a high quality, very, very high quality. Here you could see a few examples of morphology, of spectra, of timing. So here's timing of few record timing from AGN on scales of minutes. And here you see beautiful spectrum. You don't see even error bars. You could see nice morphology. You see the shell kind of dream to have seen these shells, which was uh, uh, before only in the radio and x-rays. So, and these instruments are multifunctional tools. That is also quite unique. The same instruments can serve uh, for spectrometry, for temporal studies, for morphology, for surveys, if they are uh, the um, sensitive. You can do astrophysics with extended sources, with transient phenomena, galactic astronomy, extragalactic astronomy, observational cosmology. And this all has been already realized. And the future, future is quite bright because a very powerful instrument is coming soon. It's called CTA. And at least for next 10, 15 years, for sure, will be more exciting discoveries. Although I think it's very personal, the cream already is taken. Most exciting things we, uh, we have seen, we see already, but of course we should expect also more and more excitements. Now, this is the, this is the, the imaging Cherenkov telescope technique. Now, uh, suddenly it was a bit not ac accepted it, we, 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 we are waiting for this instrument, but we couldn't realize that it could be so powerful. It is another mega project, which is the particle the detectors, detecting air showers. There are three types of these detectors. Again, excuse me, I'm not going to describe all of them. And also the spokesperson of this experiment a few months ago gave a talk here, Professor Chen Cao. So let me just say, uh, just, uh, call your attention to the sensitivities. And here you could see the jump of sensitivity at 100 TV by two orders of magnitude and still around 100 TV, 
this instrument will be sensitive compared with the future trend cover rate CTA, at least one order or actually one half order of magnitude. And this instrument does work now, does, does operate just now, taking data and with quite good performance, energy resolution 20%, 15, 20, angular resolution 0.2 degree. Well, it, it's not so bad, especially if many sources are extended. And the amazing thing is here, that is the feature of this instrument. There are so many underground muon detectors that we uh, nicely reject uh, cosmic rays, hadronic showers. And this is a quite unique in astrophysical experiment situation where you detect at least strong sources, as strong as 10% of crop, almost background free above 100 TV. So it is a beautiful because when you increase statistics, everything is grows like linearly significance, but also uh, very, very clean, extremely clean experiment. And this is a paradox because before all you are talking that all these experiments are kind of dirty experiments, a lot of background and you just try to get few sigma and now completely different situation. So now, Let's skip this, it's a too, no, it'll take too much time. I just wanted to show that almost all suspected uh, astrophysical uh, objects we see in the gamma rays. And uh, another exciting thing, we, we, I, I, this is a, something which I started some 20 years ago to filling these quadrats with yellow. And now all of them are filled actually, except for clusters. Even there are some, some claims that Comma cluster have you seen in TV gamma rays, but okay, that 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 needs confirmation. Otherwise, everything is just uh, as expected. Uh, sorry, so as not expected. Uh, I'm saying uh, suspected objects to be non-thermal, but to 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 expect that they could accelerate particles to TV PV energies. That of course no one could claim that we predicted that. Now. Uh, the, another exciting thing is just it covers many topical areas in astrophysics. One is the origin of the galactic cosmic rays, extragalactic cosmic rays, but also some uh, very modern areas like physics of relativistic outflows, physics of astrophysical outflows. I mean, the AGN jets or pulse of winds, compact objects, observational cosmology. So it's very, very exciting. Yes, I just want to show that I, to, uh, I was telling about this uh, instrument, Lahaso, and this is the first paper published half a year ago, based on only data taken with the uh, partly completed instrument, and uh, the high standards you could recognize here was only 12 sources, but requirement was to have above 100 TV, seven sigma. So that is really, uh, and, uh, and some of them, in particular, the Crab Nebula, this is the first source. Energy goes in the first paper was 0.8 PV, but now it's 1.1 PV. And another source which associates with the Cygnus cocoon, probably with the Cygnus OB2 association, it goes, there have been detected many gamma rays above 400 TV, which go one the highest one goes to 1.4 PV. So it, it is really what, what I said, no one could even dream about so to, to detect such high energies. Uh, not only because the limitation of instrumentation, but also for astrophysical reasons, but it appeared they are very effectively particle rate it and, and emit. So major topics already, already I mentioned. And uh, scientific potential, very high ultra high energies. They are unique in many cases. For example, the best instrument to solve original galactic, extragalactic cosmic ray may uh, provide key insight into a number of um, um, principal issues. For example, paradigm of pulsar, pulsar wind, pulsar wind nebulae, Astrophysics or supermassive black holes, relativistic outflows, etc. 
It could be also contribution to fundamental physics, violation of Lorentz invariance. By the way, recently Lahaso published based on the Krab data, the, the, the strongest um, upper limits uh, in this area. And uh, search of dark matter. There are some very interesting upper limits with Cherenkov telescope for dark matter. And you get that for free. You don't build special instruments. You do your astrophysical studies and uh, the, as a byproduct, you could also do by dark matter. So that is, you get for free to some extent. And another thing I'd like to um, emphasize, these are uh, less exotic issues. I mean, not uh, like relativistic MHD, which you never could have uh, in our laboratories. You could do that uh, probe with, with this gamma rays. So it's, it's really unique somehow when calling fundamental physics, always we understand to some like nuclear particle physics, gravitation, but there are a lot of exciting physics in, in classical areas like relativistic MHD. And these experiments are so clean, so high quality that you could say we, we can do also experiments to study the features of relativistic MHD. And actually we do now that. I mean, you could see a lot of studies, for example, modeling or possibly nebula uh, with uh, comparing with data, et cetera. So many of these topics are very exciting, very, 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 very special, but some of them are especially interesting. And at least in the context of my talk, they're called extreme accelerators. Uh, uh, so what are costs? Uh, uh, Let's, let's start with this, the, the, the gamma ray storm is started as a part of the cosmic rays. And when the pioneers recognized the, the importance of gamma rays, they are thinking the number one objective for gamma rays is to understand, to, 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 to um, reveal the origin of the cosmic rays. And uh, it still is there. This is one of the most important uh, topics in gamma ray astronomy. Uh, now, regarding the origin of the cosmic rays, you could often see in textbooks, reviews, since over the last decades, four or five decades, more or less the same sentence, origin of cosmic rays remains a mystery. In fact, it's exaggeration. In fact, we know a lot of cosmic rays. I don't think it's just uh, sometimes too emotional to say, it is a mystery. But what is really mystery, or I call the challenge, uh, in two part, actually, to understand the origin of the PV, uh, the part of the spectrum of the cosmic rays, there's a, uh, the so called the knee area and beyond. So they, we believe that this, this part is produced by galactic cosmic rays. And we don't have very good uh, objects theoretically to. To provide, we could provide marginally. So that is very interesting area. I'll come to that. Uh, and uh, there's a little doubt that cosmic rays above 10 to 18 have extragalactic origin, but how to get 10 to 20 EV is a challenge. And in fact, between, we don't know. Most likely they're also galactic, but then it's really hard to find how to accelerate particles up to 10 to 18 in our galaxy. So uh, these are now we call them super pivotons. So uh, th this is very important. And another aspect of the origin of the cosmic rays, at least cosmic ray physicists understand for them, this is a science which is reduced to identification of major contributors. So which object contribute to local cosmic rays, which we call, call um, local folk what we see. Of course, this is very interesting, no doubt about that, but this is um, not, uh, not uh, it cannot be only reduced to this aspect. It cosmic ray studies contain, it, they are much broader. And I already mentioned this, uh, we study the fourth substance of the visible universe, relativistic particles, which, could contribute to local folk, could not contribute to gold folk. It's another question, but just study these particles independently of this issue, the, the, well, the contributors of local folk, 
is very, very important. Now, and that's one of these questions goes beyond, uh, which goes beyond the original local cosmic rays is the physics of extreme accelerators. I promise to say uh, that to, to, to make, uh, to give a definition, there's a definition. Uh, so the, 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 the point number one, I just realized it's not a definition, it's just feature. So most of the extreme accelerators uh, can accelerate, can transfer energy of available energy, pointy twice, it could be, it could be MHV waves, uh, it could be um, something else, up to 50%, they could convert to no thermal particles. But a real definition is two. From the classical electrodynamics, we know that the acceleration rate goes like E to electric field and C. And if you express the electric field uh, through parameter eta, the ratio electric field to magnetic field, which in the ideal MHD is always less than one, then this is a maximum rate allowed, with, allowed by classical electrodynamics and ideal MHD. So if you combine now, in order to explain this sum of data, we, we need to uh, assume that it is very close to one. And at close to one, we called extreme, uh, extreme accelerators. So, and I'll show you a few examples of them, not now as a theoretical, uh, just kind of um, uh, concepts, but also observational. So to be very uh, brief, the Crab Nebula is extreme accelerator and most likely sources of 10 to 20 EV cosmic rays are extreme accelerators. So let's start with the Crab Nebula. Claim about the extreme accelerator comes not from the gamma rays. It is believed that the gamma, the spectrum of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Crab Nebula, synchron spectrum, extends up to 100 MeV and beyond. And this, uh, it is believed that this is a synchron emission. Synchron emission in, in extreme accelerators, if you get the maximum energy of electrons is written here as a, you see dependence on eta parameter. And then when you calculate the, this uh, corresponding frequency, you get for the electrons, electron synchron emission, electron uh, photons, 0.15 GV or 150 MeV and linearly depends on eta parameter. So if you go to 100 MeV or more, then you could say this is extreme uh, accelerator to some extent. Although he is not clear what, what means the frequency of, 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 of frequency of the photon, because you could assume some cutoff in the electron spectrum, but still it, its spectrum goes to higher energies. So you call it, uh, you, you think that uh, like exponentially, exponential cutoff, still a lot of highest energies. So this could go even beyond. So another uncertainty here is that we don't know magnetic field. Of course, we could guess some magnetic field. What is the magnetic field? For example, in the crop, in the one zone model, we get magnetic field comparing the intensity at gamma ray and uh, in the in X-rays and then derive magnetic field 100 microgauss. But it's not clear that exactly what, what we see this from this comparison, these highest energy particles are accelerated there. Maybe it could accelerate, are accelerated in uh, different regions. And, and of course, in the case, non, non one zone model that could be different. Gamma rays are a completely different story. Yeah, this inverse Compton gamma rays. Uh, the, in the crab, even such a compact nebula, the only the, the main radiation field for production of the gamma rays inverse Compton scattering are 2.7 K. So you know the target perfectly. And then if you detect gamma rays, you are convinced they are coming from the inverse Compton on 2.7 K and that you could be convinced easily. Then you immediately could connect gamma ray energy to electron energy and you know any electron energies. Here it happens in the so-called transition Thomson to Kleidishian transition region, but from 30 TV to approximately 3 PV, you could use this approximate formula. In, in Thomson uh, regime, you, you, you remember it is square, and in Kleidishian regime, it's 
just proportional in this transition regime is such a, and this uh, such a behavior. So this is very unique in astrophysics situation, not only the crop, when you detect photons, then you detect, you know, you are, you are detecting energy of the electron. So you are really tracing electrons with gamma rays. We don't need any assumptions like synchron, uh, in synchron um, uh, case, you have to assume about magnetic field. Of course, we could make very uh, reasonable assumptions of magnetic field. Still, this is assumption. Here, you don't need any assumption. What you see, this is the electrons. So you could derive electron spectrum with highest possible accuracy because we know cross-section very well. And at the same time, if you have the, the uh, extended sources, the, 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 the morphology, gamma morphology immediately tells you about the uh, distribution, special distribution of electrons. Of course, this is the projection, but still you, you have, this is, there, there's no any example in astrophysics where you just do with the radiation immediately get information about the particles. So, and I'll come to crab later with observations. Just to mention that this, the, there's some confusion about this, what is the uh, maximum energy uh, in the sense, but um, to say that the crab is uh, uh, operating as a um, extreme accelerator, there's little doubt because uh, recent, uh, the, the, the so a few years ago, uh, discovered the fl uh, crop flares in a hundred MeV region showed that excess of this emission above the steady state and also shifting to high energies. Uh, it is another issue if it will be time or time will be questions I could explain, but this is a nice example. We, we, we knew about uh, the crop as extreme accelerator and we could estimate the energy of electrons, but we need a lot of assumption and there are a lot of uncertainties actually in this picture. So uh, no, no much time to go with that. So second example I want to show you is highest energy cosmic rays. Uh, so this is the highest energy cosmic, cosmic rays, which uh, the, the, the famous physicist, astrophysicist, Michael Hillas, many years ago had a sound for fun, a plot. I mean, uh, uh, comparing a lot more radius of the size of the sources and found very interesting picture that uh, if you want to get 10 to 20 EV protons, you don't have many objects in the universe. I mean, we, uh, since we know the more or less the size of magnetic field, you could discard many, many other objects and keep only a few. For example, you could, could keep the radio galaxy lobes or large scale jets and galaxy clusters I mean, there are some recent works by Tony Bell, by the way, that was showing if they never could accelerate particles well beyond 10 to 18 maybe. The same with galactic, uh, galaxy clusters. The, the gal galaxy clusters uh, contain the accretion shocks with few thousand kilometers per second, which formally is sufficient for Hubble time to get 10 to 20. But there are energy losses of protons, so-called beta Heidler pair production interacting 2.7K, which stop them again at the level of 10 to 18, so it does work. So you have to go to compact objects, but if you go to compact objects, you should increase magnetic field to satisfy this condition. But if you increase magnetic field, then you, 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 uh, proton synchron radiation becomes important issue. And then that, that is disaster. I mean, you could not have um, much more than one kilo gauss magnetic field, but if you even assume one kilo gauss, uh, it's, it still could be okay. We could assume Lorentz factor, the source is moving with the bulk motion, the Lorentz factor bulk motion more than 10, then, then in principle, you could do that. Another option is just to assume that uh, protons are moving along uh, the, uh, the, the magnetic field, then you don't have synchron emission, but you still have uh, the, um, curvature uh, losses, so it helps not too much. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm running, I mean, time, so I go too fast, just to say that, uh, so what could be these sources? I mean, most likely these are uh, small scale, sorry, I'm going back, small scale jets, 
uh, and uh, you could say could be blazars. Blazars, by the way, are the most po the largest population of TV gamma ray objects, and could be the, then be sources of 10 to 20 protons. Formally, yes, they can. But the models, the most popular models we have for explaining gamma rays, so-called inverse Compton models, they do not work because they require very small magnetic fields. It cannot work by definition. Uh, still, this magnetic field also is not, seems not realistic, such a small magnetic fields. By the way, in this case, the, 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 the energy uh, is not clear where you take energy. Well, it's clear, but it's very difficult to, to get it. So could be another option. Again, I mean, it's the challenge. Uh, So-called hadronic models, if you, the radiation comes from, gamma radiation comes from the protons. If, it's, if it can be done, you could see, it could fit formally nicely the spectra. And in large magnetic field, you don't have problem with variability to explain flares in AGN, but uh, there are problems of energetic problems. I mean, you, you should assume huge energy most likely more than adding to luminosity uh, to, to explain with synchrotron protons, but this is, cannot be excluded because we do have other reasons to believe that there are uh, some, uh, we have a luminosity energetics in these objects exceeding uh, the um, editor luminosity, which is not a crime to assume that because edictone luminosity is simply the pressure of the radiation here. Yeah, energy is in, not in the radiation, is in the kinetic phase. Okay, coming to some other, uh, so this is a, about cosmic rays. Here, um, uh, we, we, we have a very good news that the supernova remnant paradigm of galactic cosmic rays, which comes from since Baden Zwicky famous papers, and also the introduction of diffusive shock acceleration theory. We believe that it sh should, it works. Uh, it has some challenges, but not too many. But on the other hand, at low energies, at the highest energies, challenges are very serious. We were very happy to see gamma rays, TV gamma rays from these objects, but we're disappointed to see cutoffs uh, or steepening much earlier than we expected. So uh, this part, um, uh, conclusion was they should accelerate particles to, to 200 TV, no more. But uh, this is not true in fact, because if you, like, like this is the highest, the, the highest energy cosmic rays uh, accelerated by a supernova, young super, uh, supernova remnant, you could see the cutoff, you derive this data from uh, the proton spectrum from data, you see it's around 100 TV or less, but uh, more seriously, many other, all of them are, have a steep spectra. So this is disaster or not. If cut off, then it's still, they cannot accelerate to TV energies. However, if you go to, um, you, you want to really study the going this, these objects to TV energies, you need very sensitive instruments. And so if you extrapolate, different ways to available energy for Casse to PV, you could see that only, only uh, uh, Lhaso, even um, after a few years can probe 100 PV bands. So I think it's too early to claim that Casse cannot accelerate particles to PV energies. Uh, now we have this instrument we, 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 and hopefully in few years we'll have definite answer. What is exciting with the Casse, another very excitement, is that um, if you don't detect gamma rays, you could say that uh, there could be argument that the cosmic rays have been accelerated at very early epochs, like first 100 years or 10 years or one year, and the advocate could say, okay, they have been accelerated, they already left. But Casse is young, 300 years. So this particle could not go much further. And then they, 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 they occupy some 100 parsec region and upper limits. If you don't see gamma rays with such a serious upper limits, you could say never particles have been accelerated in Casse. So this could be very, very 
important um, part for. So another, unfortunately, young supernova remnants, we don't have many young supernova remnants. But then there are middle-aged supernova remnants. Of course, you don't, should not expect gamma rays from these objects, but you could see the smoking gas from the, near, as, uh, the uh, nearby dense clouds. Uh, if cosmic rays already escape the remnants, they travel for 10, four years, thousand years, 10,000 years. And when they arrive and enter the cloud, uh, they start to emit. And from there you could uh, derive uh, your conclusion. This is one of the Lhasa sources, actually, which there's a supernova remnant, maybe not so much exciting, but they should not be exciting because these are old. But uh, we see simply, uh, we simply, we see the echo from this smoking gas. So will be many, many these kinds of sources we will also in coming years. And I think also will be good. So uh, another option is the, if uh, let's assume supernova range will not work, then what? Then comes another very interesting alternative, young massive clusters. And already there are very good arguments why clusters should be sources of high stage cosmic rays. And, uh, but more importantly, recently we see more and more, there's mounting evidence for uh, gamma rays coming or young massive clusters or st stellar clusters. And what is interesting, it's, 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 they show perfect behavior. If you derive the radial distribution of protons, not gamma rays, you see all, all over one over R distribution, which implies continuous injection. If, um, so that is the case. Supernova remnant, you have a constant, uh, you have a constant, um, you, you have a co constant uh, the, the distribution. And the, the, the spectrum is very interesting, 1.2. So this is an old, few years old pictures, very exciting ones that clusters could be sources. And now what happens, last one, two years, few groups, the Hulk and the Tibet, start to report that gamma rays are going to 100 TV. And then last year, Lahaso arrived and now measures spectrum, unfortunately are not published. We know that fact, we announced that they are detected, but we could not say the spectra. It's very exciting. I can only tell you that there are many sources, many photons detected above half PV. So that is already interesting. And uh, also, other instruments has, for example, uh, measured now spectrum of the Westerlund one classical up to 100 TV. So something is very exciting is coming. So what we should expect in future, um, it could be just we'll reconsider this supernova remnant paradigm, replacing supernova remnants by young, 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 uh, young uh, stellar clusters. I call it. Uh, young stars versus dead stars, but it could be not young star versus dead stars. It could be both, could be supernova remnants as well. We should not rush and then to be claimed that supernova remnants do not work. We need time for that. So, and all these answers could be addressed by, 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 by uh, Lahaso. There are, of course, we should consider other sources, especially if we won't go well beyond 10 PV. So even young, uh, massive clusters hardly could provide much more than 10 TV, but we believe that cosmic ray spectrum was 100 TV. So who, what could be there? Could be galactic center, which is, we have a unique source there, Sagittarius A star, and could be microquasars. So I still, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time. I spent too much time on introduction, but so these are another exciting thing we expect much uh, very, we should be prepared for unexpected results. And I do know some results, but I cannot tell you. <laughs> so that could be very exciting. Now, I'm going to uh, about the crab again, back to the crab to show that crab has been detected up to one PV. It is proved that is a pevatron model independent. You don't need to, uh, to, to, to make any assumption. And what will happen? Then the, this was only the data taken effectively for one full array year, but now even less. Now, we, uh, the, since last June, uh, the array uh, operates 
in its full power. And in one, two years, you'll see beautiful spectra going to PV, and then you could conclude what is happening in this extreme pebatron. Uh, uh, Richard, may I have three more minutes? I mean, I'm very sorry, I'm running too long. So just, just a question about this, Crab is, often we say Crab is the very effective gamma ray emitter, it's not true. Crab is very effective electron accelerator, and Crab is very powerful electron accelerator, but is very, not effective gamma ray emitter because energy of uh, major fraction of energy goes to uh, synchrotron emission, you could see here, but not to gamma ray emission. So it means that uh, we should expect also from other pulsars, possibly nebulae, and we do see, I mean, the, has detected more than 10 uh, reliably uh, uh, this possibly nebulae surrounding uh, other pulsars. In this case, gamma rays sources are extended, magnetic is small, efficiency is very high, which compensate low spin down. And uh, another thing is just, uh, just I'm showing one figure. So this is a pulsar uh, with nebula, but they discovered by this. There's a very strange behavior. Energy goes, the, 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 you expect with energy larger and larger size for the source because uh, they going uh, uh, propagating faster uh, because of diffusion. However, we see opposite picture. This could be explained without problem uh, by energy losses of electrons, highest energy electrons lose their energy. But on the scales we see, it doesn't work. And this is or another source is called 1825, it's from the Hess. You see this less than one PV, this is the size and more than 30 TV, which corresponds to electrons more than 100, 200 TV is almost point-like source focused on the pulsar. So what could be explanation? My favorite explanation is the following. At very highest energies, diffusion, uh, diffusion uh, becomes not anymore, propagation becomes not anymore diffusive. It becomes ballistic. And if you have ballistic motion, then you occupy more and more space, physical space. But image is getting smaller because, and, and the, uh, the ideal uh, the case, if you have rectilinear beams, then you see the point like source. Even you produce gamma rays in a hundred parsec or tens of parsec region. And this could be the case. So I just will finish now my talk saying I expect very much from this effect, especially for Lahaso sources, because what that means, all sources we are detecting, we call them pevatrons, but this, it, it is wrong. These are not pevatrons, these are gamma ray emitters. Certainly there is a pevatron somewhere accelerator, but where, we don't know. If this effect works, then exactly, we've even, it, we have produced in the huge area volume, then they, they, they go and get the, uh, you get the accelerator. Exactly, this point like source should, so is, is imaginary point like, it's not, Im, it is a very extended source, but image is point like source, and that would be exactly on accelerator, you could fix them. The second uh, interesting effect is, if they are rectilinearly, there's energy independent propagation, then spectrum is not modified by propagation effects for diffusion, that means, if you measure spectrum, it will be acceleration spectrum. It will be not modified spectrum. So this gives a unique opportunity to talk to localized pevatrons and measure, measure undistorted uh, electron spectrum. So I, 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 I'm sorry, I should stop at this moment. So the summary is here, is written, or everything is, what I said is more or less written here. So I don't, I'll not take your time to read myself. So if there are questions. Please. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, uh, Felix. I think you've given us a glimpse into a glorious future. It's very tantalizing. Um, it does seem like we're on the edge of, of some observational breakthroughs. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a few questions right now. We can always go on later for the extended discussion. 
But please, uh, um, anybody who wants to ask uh, Felix in the plenary session, please put your hand up. Um, may I, maybe I can just ask something in the meantime, um, Felix, I mean, you, you showed this tantalizing spectrum of the Cygnus cocoon. I mean, just uh, to get that up, it, it just looks, looked almost continuous. No, well, no, not coming. I mean, I, I, I'm just trying to put a line for the points from 10 to the that last point above 10 to the no, no, you don't do that, Richard. You know what? This comes from the whole or uh, some other experiments. In fact, this is extended source, two degree source, and there are several features. This is all some, some of all these features, they are different, in fact. So it's not continuous. They are very, I mean, I, 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 I'll be very happy to share with you. I mean, but that is coming in. Maybe we're just yeah, working. Uh, no, no, uh, okay. paper. I, I mean, I mean, look, there, 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 there may be spectral features in in that you're able to sort of um, measure more precisely in the future. I mean, um, in terms of the emission you see in these extended structures, um, I, I can you comment on whether these are sort of leptonic or hadronic um, processes? Um. Uh, okay, so this is this is I think it it is a question which always we have this face. But here, to have a one PV, gamma ray one for PV, I mean, no way. I mean, you need a it's it's only inverse Compton, and the inverse Compton could be only two point seven k. By the way, because uh, for other fields, even far infrared, it will be deep uh, deep Kleinishina, so it 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 doesn't work. So on the other hand, so these electrons do not move. I mean, the four, four six PV electrons cannot move even a uh, few parsecs. Uh, we don't, uh, so, and here we deal with a hundred parsec structure. So you have to, uh, to, to, to produce them inside right. the, so they cannot go far from the accelerator. So this is the trivial one. There are some other, so let 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 look what could be. I mean, if it's inverse Compton, so if then you could use the radiation field like from the, let us assume OB two is the accelerator, OB two cluster, but then you have a huge radiation field which uh, drops like one of R square. So your target already drops, and the uh, protons inject uh, sorry electrons injected also drops one over R. So together drops one of our cube. So you should see the peak to the accelerator. You don't see anything like that. I mean, I mean, you'll draw, I mean, if you think about the star cluster and you get beyond the radius of the star cluster, that's true. Um, I, 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 I can't, I'm not familiar with the um, linear extents you're, uh, you're, you're considering here. Uh, I mean, if, if you want the infrared as seed photons, which you don't seem to, Think is important. I mean, you, uh, Richard, infrared, scale. even yeah. hundred micron infrared. If you take electron, electrons should at least uh, sh you should have. If you have a gamma ray one point four PV, then you should have at least one point four PV electron. Yeah. So it is a very very deep Kleinishina. Mm. Extremely uh, the deep Okay, so, so basically, electrons are ruled out because there's no in situ sources of such high energy electrons at such high distances from for one for for one PV hundred for one PV hundred percent for for hundred TV, let's say ninety nine percent for low energies. We could bring a lot of other arguments, but then we could debate. But right. for I think one point four TV PV, I think it's difficult even to imagine how it could happen. Okay, I'm just looking for further questions. I don't see any at the moment. Um, we will extend the Zoom session after a formal send off for Felix. So there was ample opportunity to sort of delve into the um, nitty gritty on, on many of the points that uh, Felix showed in his colloquium. Um, so if there aren't any more questions, I'll just proceed to make an announcement um, for which I will need to take the screen. Um, yeah, I'll take the screen and uh, go to my desktop. I hope it's there. 
Yes, and I want to just, uh, first of all, thank everybody for supporting the series this, this semester. I think we had a lot of very interesting um, colloquia and, and a lot of very interesting discussion resulting. And I know that in many cases that resulted in sort of collaborative processes being initiated and lots of correspondence. Um, if you missed any of the colloquia, um, please go to um, this site where I think all but one, or except for the last two, are already up. So uh, if you want something interesting to do in the in the in the in between the semesters, please look that. Um, we're coming up to the summer semester, um, and I just like to reiterate the the the, the sort of. Um, what we try to do with this joint astronomical colloquium. We have six institutes in Heidelberg and we would like everybody in those institutes to um, participate in an active way by proposing speakers. And if they get um, accepted, then of course, um, that person who proposed uh, would be also playing a major role in hosting these speakers and introducing them to the other colleagues in Heidelberg. So please, um, over, over the next weeks, please feel free to communicate to the Institute um, representatives here, or um, if, if you know of uh, good speakers, interesting things going on in the community in, in, in astrophysics may not yet be widely known. Those are the sort of um, colloquia we're particularly interested in. Um, and so it just remains for me now just to, uh, Look ahead, we see everybody again on the 27th of April for the first colloquium in the summer. I believe that's the first date. We've not actually discussed it yet, but I think that's correct. Um, okay, so now I'll hand the screen back and I'll ask everybody to open their videos and open their microphones and let's give Felix a good send off. Thank you, Felix. Thank you.